We are here today because Jesus is the Messiah. That's why we're gathered here, because Jesus is the Messiah, and he must be worshipped. I think sometimes we get confused about why we're here. I think sometimes we forget about why we're here. I think sometimes we think, oh, that's just kind of what we do. But we are here because Jesus is the Messiah, and he must be worshipped. A lot of people, though, uh, don't understand this. A lot of people aren't sure. They're not sure whether or not Jesus is the Messiah. And Jesus' day, they even grumble about him. Their motives were wrong. Their focus on works is wrong. A lot of people are like that today. They're fo- they focus on works. They think they can earn their own salvation. The people of Jesus' day, their motives were wrong. Their focus on works was wrong. And they needed to be saved. They needed to place their faith in Jesus as the Messiah. And that's what had been revealed up to that point in time. We've been looking uh, over the last few weeks, apart from the last two weeks, where Brother Joe, man, am I thankful that he he stepped in these last two weeks and we had a great vacation. Thank you, by the way, for that. Um, And look forward to uh, having you preach more. But anyway, (laughs) Um, during the last few weeks before Joe preached, we were kind of looking at a detailed conversation in John 6, between Jesus and some Jews at a Capernaum synagogue. Now, you know, it's been a few weeks. You probably don't remember a whole lot of things about, about that. I'll just kind of real quick give you a little, for those of you who like, you know, well, where's Capernaum? What's that whole business about? This is modern day Israel, all right? And don't worry about all the different colors and all that stuff. Basically, the, the key points I want you to, the key places I want you to see are just really the bodies of water. You have the Mediterranean Sea, you have the Dead Sea, and up, up the Jordan River here. Um, I don't know if you can see that arrow. You probably can't see it online, but uh, this, this body of water right here is the Sea of Galilee. And Capernaum is right at the northwestern shores. If we zoom in on the Sea of Galilee, on the northwestern shores of the Sea of Galilee, right there. That's supposed to be an arrow. It's supposed to be a point here. You could see, and you could follow that point. (laughs) That's that's where Capernaum is. Now, just to kind of give you an idea of what, where they are, they're at this synagogue. Now, over on the left side of this picture, you're going to see, you see that structure? That's like a, it's made of like a limestone, uh, limestone rock, whatever. And that's actually a fourth century, maybe a fifth century synagogue. It was built way after Jesus, right? Uh, three, four hundred years after Jesus' time. But you see all those black, the black basalt rocks around it. Underneath that synagogue is the foundation for the Capernaum synagogue. The very place where Jesus ministered, where Jesus read. Here, uh, I think I have a picture. You could see the the limestone 4th, 5th century structure built right on the black basalt rocks where Jesus' synagogue stood. All right, that's pretty cool. Being there and really thinking, like, Jesus was here. Now, you can't worship places, you know what I mean? You, you just can't, you can't do that. But um, I thought maybe this would be valuable to uh, take a look at a before and after because uh, this is kind of what it looks like Today, I don't know if you can, you can see that. That's the structure of the 4th, 5th century synagogue. And, and this, this before and after, it's, it's an amazing image. It really kind of brings, it really puts you in Jesus' day to let you know what things look like. Check this out. You ready? <laughs> it's just like, that's not really the best drawing in the world, right? <laughs> But I saw that, I laughed out loud. Like, no, you gotta have better than that. I mean, there's definitely better ones than that, but um, let's see if I have something else. It's just a cartoon draw. <laughs> I mean, there are some really good ones. I, so I looked, in, I looked in my library and I saw another one. I'm like, oh, look, yeah, there's the church, uh, St. Peter's house. Let's see what that looked like. And it was just another drawing. I mean, you've seen some good ones, like, like the one at Jerusalem. Let me, here, this is, this is very good. This is the one, this is what Jerusalem looks like today. This is what Jerusalem looked like in Jesus' day. That's very good. I was hoping for that with the Capernaum Synagogue. I didn't quite get it. But I do have something that might be a little better for you. 
And I showed you this a few weeks ago. This is a, this is a model. This isn't technically at Capernaum. This is a model of a synagogue in Nazareth. So it's similar, except this would be a black basalt synagogue. So it'd be very similar to this structure. It looks something like that. Well, that's kind of where Jesus is in this town. And this is, this is actually a real look at what the, the city of Capernaum, the town of Capernaum, would have looked like. Right at the northern shores in the Sea of Galilee, you'd be looking south down the Sea of Galilee. This is where Jesus is. And he's having this conversation uh, with these Jews at this Capernaum synagogue. And in that conversation, he says that he is the bread of life. And that that bread has come down from heaven. And he's just used this strong metaphorical statement that was, that was heavily misunderstood when he said that people need to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Now, he wasn't talking about literally eating his flesh and drinking his blood. He wasn't talking about communion or anything like that. This was a metaphorical statement that in context, if you want to understand the full context, I'm not going to go back and rehash all that, but you could go back and listen to those, the last two messages that I preached in John 6, that this is talking about faith, internalizing faith in Jesus Christ. Anyone who places their faith in Jesus Christ will be saved, and they'll have everlasting life. And that's, that's really what Jesus is saying in John 6. But these Capernaum Jews, uh, they are offended by Jesus. They're offended by him. They don't want to place their faith in him. They're not really committed to following him. And that is where the rubber meets the road for these Jews. And these Jews, even some of his so-called disciples, even some people who claim to be followers of Jesus, there are a lot of people in churches that claim to be followers of Jesus. All types of different churches, too. And there are a lot of people in fundamental Baptist churches like ours that claim to be followers of Jesus. Even some of his followers grumbled against him. Look at John 6 and verse 59. Verse 59 and 60. These things he said in the synagogue... As he taught in Capernaum. And I just kind of showed you some of that. Therefore many of his disciples. When they heard this said. When they heard Jesus talking about. Eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And really ta talking about faith. Therefore many of his disciples. When they heard this said. This is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? That's what they said. This is an offensive statement. They're offended by Jesus. They say, who can listen to it? And these are Jesus' followers. They're not the, these, they, we're not talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees here. We're not talking about the scribes and the religious leaders here. We're talking about some of Jesus' disciples. And they're following Jesus, but only as long as they hear what they like. A lot of church people like that today. A lot of church people who are church people. You know, I use that word church people, and most of you understand what I mean when I say that because I define it over and over again. That's not the same as a Christian necessarily. That's a person that shows up for church. And maybe that's all. Maybe even reads their Bible a little bit, maybe even prays a little bit. A lot of church people are like that. They follow Jesus enough to be called outwardly disciples or to be called followers of him, but they aren't really committed to him. And they aren't really committed to his teachings. And they're not ready to take up their cross and follow him. And they don't like the hard sayings of scripture. And they can't accept difficult statements of the Bible and difficult doctrines like, for instance, church discipline. I once had a man say, I don't believe anyone should ever be disciplined out of a church for any reason, ever. And I basically said, then you reject what God says. Because God talks about it over and over again. Jesus himself talks about it in Matthew 18. These Jews here in Capernaum, they love the miracles. They love the free food that he provided. Remember the feeding of the 5,000? They love the idea of a political messiah. And glory here on earth. Because, you know, if you, if you uh, hitch your cart to, you know, the right politician, you might find yourself in a good spot. 
Although if you hitched your cart to Biden, you might find yourself in a bad spot right now. I mean, it's pretty rough what's going on right now in Afghanistan, but whatever. That's another issue for another day. Some people hitch their carts to a politician hoping that they'll gain some spot in administration. And that's kind of how they're viewing Jesus, many of them. And so they love the idea of a political messiah, but they reject the idea that Jesus is greater than Moses. And they reject the idea that he is really, ultimately, that they need to place their faith in him. Because he doesn't line up with what they want from the Messiah. They don't want a suffering servant. They don't don't want someone they have to place their faith in. They want someone who will have glory here and now on this earth. Someone who will overthrow the Romans and give Israel back its independence. That's what they want. Anyway, Jesus hears their grumbling, and he questions these so-called disciples. He calls to question whether their faith is genuine, and that's, that's a reasonable and legitimate thing to do sometimes. Look at verses 61 and 62. But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Listen, these guys are grumblers, just like Israel in the desert. They're offended, just like Israel in the wilderness. And so Jesus says, does this cause you to stumble? Does this cause you to be offended? Does this make you angry? And if this offends you, then what happens when Jesus dies on the cross? What happens when Jesus is buried in a tomb? What happens when Jesus rises from the dead? What happens when he ascends? into heaven to sit at the right hand of his father. How will you respond then? These guys don't want a Messiah that's a suffering servant. They don't want a Messiah who will suffer on the cross. They don't want a Messiah who, on on, on his terms, they want him on their own terms. They want a Messiah who will deliver them from Rome. The idea of a crucified Messiah is a stumbling block to the Jews. But Jesus must suffer and die on a cross. He must pay the penalty for the sins of the world. Jesus has come to seek and to save that which was lost, Luke 19.10 says. The cross is the very thing that ultimately does exalt Jesus. But these guys don't want anything to do with that. Because their mindset's on the here and now. Their mindset is on food and drink. The physical realm. They don't want to hear Jesus' teachings. They want a Messiah that they choose after their own preferences and after their own desires. And I'm going to tell you, many, many people who claim the name of Jesus are exactly the same way. But Jesus' words are true, and every man is a liar. Verse 63, it is the Spirit who gives life The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. Jesus recognizes that these so-called disciples are lost. They're not really his followers. They don't want to submit to the convicting work of God's Holy Spirit. They don't understand what Jesus is saying because they reject what Jesus is saying. They think that Jesus is talking literally about eating his flesh. They don't realize that the flesh profits nothing. That what Jesus was saying was a metaphorical statement about faith. And he made it abundantly clear if they were paying attention. The problem is they weren't listening to him. They hear what they want to hear. Ever meet a person like that? You say one thing, right? And they hear something entirely different. And there's nothing you could do to convince them that you didn't say the thing that they quote-unquote heard. Right? I've had conversations like that in the past uh, where I've talked to someone and sometimes I write down what I'm going to say because I know sometimes what happens. So I write down what I want to say. When, when it comes to conflict, sometimes I'll write down what I want to say. And then a person would, and, and I'll have my notes sometimes even in front of me, what I want to say. These are the things I want to say. And a person will come out and be entirely offended at something I never even said. You ever have a conversation like that with someone? Nothing you could do to convince them. 
They're convinced of their false understanding and you can't convince them otherwise. Jesus says to them, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. These are spiritual truths. These are truths of eternal life. They're, they're not about the flesh. We're not talking about cannibalism here. There's nothing in this world that can save a person. There's no flesh. There's no work that can save a person. It's only by faith alone. These people, they need to repent. These Capernaum Jews need to repent. They need to change their minds about their sin. They need to change their minds about the law, about their trusting in the law. And they need to place their faith in Jesus as the Messiah. And that's what had been revealed up to that point in time. They needed to place their faith that Jesus was the Messiah. We need to place our faith in the completed work of Christ. If they place their faith in Jesus as the Messiah of God, they would be his disciples. They would be his followers. Unfortunately, these so-called disciples at Capernaum are not genuine. And Jesus makes that abundantly clear. Verse 64. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were, who did not believe, and who it was that would betray him. Uh, earlier in this gospel, there were some Jews who seemed to believe in Jesus' name. But their faith was questionable. And of course, Jesus knows whose faith is legitimate. And back in John 2, Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men, because he did not need anyone to testify concerning men, for he himself knew what was in man. Jesus knows who his followers are. Jesus knows the genuinely saved. And he knows who does not believe. And he knows who would betray him. You know, I find that interesting. Uh, imagine spending two and a half, three and a half years with 12 guys. And knowing all along one of those guys is going to stab you in the back. That would be, I mean, how do you do that? How do you do that? I th like, I would just separate from the guy early on, just distance myself and not even be around that guy. Um, but, you know, I'm not Jesus either. Jesus knows the genuinely saved. Look at verse 65. And he was saying, For this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. Now, we talked about that. We talked about that in detail three weeks ago. Three Sundays ago. One, two, three Sundays ago. So I'm not going to go through that again. But God grants salvation as a free gift to anyone who will place their faith in Jesus Christ. Faith is the key to understanding chapter 6. And we sh I showed you that over and over. Again, I can't unpack that whole thing again for sake of time. It's already a long service. Faith is the key to understanding this passage. Salvation by grace through faith is the gift of God, according to Ephesians Two, eight, and 9. Again, the Father wants all men to be saved. He draws all men to himself by means of the convicting work of his spirit. Some will resist God, while others will place their faith in Christ. Jesus knows those who are genuinely saved. Unfortunately, many of his followers walk away from him. Look at verse 66. And by the way, this is the stuff of pastor nightmares. All right. Uh, as a verse 66, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. Now, I've got a picture of how this played out. I've got a picture of Jesus there talking with these guys, and one by one, these guys just kind of getting up and leaving. I don't know how accurate that picture is. But that's how sometimes my dreams have worked in the past. So, so there have been a few times, and I've just entered into, I've just entered into my 10th year as the pastor here. So nine full years, I've entered into my 10th year. Uh, I'm, I think, the third longest tenured guy here. I'm hoping to break the record if you guys will let me, but if you fire me before then, I, you know, our record's only 20 years, so I feel like I'm a pretty young guy. I can, I can probably do that if I if I, if I don't get the urge to, like, move down into, you know, the warmth of Florida, I, like I just was living down there. But, uh, but anyway, um, in that 10-year period, nine-year period of time, I've had a few nightmares about church stuff. And one nightmare, a guy comes in, I won't name the guy, but the guy comes in trying to shoot me, okay? And I'm, like, hiding, I'm, like, jumping, like, under stuff while he's trying to kill me, right? I mean, 
it's, it's wild sometimes the things that go on in your dreams. Joe was talking about a, 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 a gas station slash Wendy's slash bookstore, right, and two weeks ago. I love that because it's just that's how dreams are, right? But um, in, in, in one of these dreams, and it's probably happened two or three times or maybe even more than that, I'm preaching and someone walks out. Right? And that happens all the time. You know, people, someone walks out. Sometimes, some, sometimes you, you haven't, haven't seen it, but sometimes people walk out in anger. I've seen people walk out in anger, and that's uncomfortable. It really is uncomfortable. Because you're, you're in the middle of a sentence, and you just, <laughs> and they walk out. And you just get, keep, keep preaching. What are you going to do but keep preaching? You never see them again, right? Um, or you get a resignation letter, uh, you know, a week later or something like that. And, and believe me, those things are never nice. They're never like, oh, you're such a wonderful person, but I'm never coming back. You know, it's, it's, they're never nice. They're either it's like two sentences long or like three pages long, all right? So just send the two sentence long one if you're ever gonna leave. I resign and just be done. That's all I need to know. If I wanna know more, I'll track you down and I'll find out more, but I usually already know. Okay, anyway, um, in the dream, oh, there, there, there goes Jen. <laughs> I know where you live, <laughs> or neighbors. Um, so in the dream, one person leaves, and then, you know, two more people leave, and then five more people leave, and then before you know it, like, everyone gets up and leaves, and they're, like, shaking their head at you in, like, in, like scorn and disdain. And you're standing there, like, embarrassed, because everyone has walked out because you don't even know. You must have said something, like, terrible, right? And there's, like, one person left in the whole thing. And that's, like, that's how we, that's, that's, a, that's called a pastor nightmare, Right, so whatever you guys, not, you, maybe some of you dream about like falling and, and the ground gets closer and closer and closer. Or you're running. You ever have that dream where you're running and you can't get, you can't get away from the guy behind? My dream is everybody walks out. All right, that's, that's what we dream about. Or, or someone wants to kill you. One of the, <laughs> but, 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 but what is a pastor nightmare in this passage? Is actuality in Jesus' life here? Jesus isn't going through this in his dream, right? He's going through it in real life. People get up and leave. And the pain that's associated with that. As he sees entire groups get up and walk away. Entire groups get up and reject him. This crowd rejects him and he knows the truth. And so there isn't just that pain, surely, of rejection, but that pain of these people are giving up eternity. These people are walking out on Jesus and into hell. It is a lonely and painful experience, I'm sure. And the only way I can ever relate to that is the thought that I've had from time to time, and I've expressed this to you, from time to time I'll have the thought, is anyone following me? You know, and every once in a while I'll have that conversation with Rob. Do you think anyone here is actually following me? You know, and of course, you know, there's some correction that has to be had. You know, it's really, they're not really following you. They're following Jesus. And, and, um, but still, you know, are they, walking, are, they, are they walking with you towards Jesus? You know, there's that thought that comes. And that's a lonely, painful time of introspection. But it's nothing compared to this. What Jesus is experiencing. But all these people walk away to their own damnation. These Jews stopped seeing Jesus as the Messiah. And they start seeing him as, a, as an apostate. As a false teacher. Jesus, the Son of God, the one who came to seek and to save that which was lost, is now in their minds an apostate. Same type of thing happens today. Sometimes people, they just walk away from God. Sometimes never to return. Sometimes for a couple months, sometimes for a couple of years, sometimes for many years, sometimes forever. The only people who are left when all is said and done are Jesus and his 12 disciples. You imagine all these people leave, Jesus and his, the, the whole synagogue clears out and Jesus and his 12 disciples, everybody walks away. We, we, we have, you ever have the, the picture of uh, the Amish shunning where they just, you know, we don't even want to look at you. We don't even want to go. I've had, I've, had, I've had that happen where I've walked past, like, someone who maybe attended our church some years back, and they pretended like I wasn't even there. Call out their name a few times, you know, and pretend I'm not even there. I've been shunned! Anyone here ever been shunned? <laughs> Pastors get shunned from time to time, but it's, it's a real shame. But um, 
It's like that moment where all these people shun Jesus. And it's just Jesus and his 12. And he turns to the 12 and he asks a most important question in verse 67. So Jesus said to the 12, you do not want to go away also, do you? Will everyone leave Jesus? Will everyone abandon the Messiah? Will Peter, James, and John abandon him even? Of course, Jesus knows the answer already, right? And uh, look what Peter says. And, and, and I love, I love, Peter has the best words sometimes. He has the worst ones too. But, but I love these words. He has all the best words. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. Lord, to whom shall we go? I imagine at that, moment, at that moment in time, perhaps some of the sweetest words Jesus has heard in his earthly walk, in his earthly ministry. To whom shall we go? Peter recognizes there is no one else. There is no other Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. Regardless of whether or not he fits what they thought of the Messiah, Regardless of whether or not he fits their mold, they recognize that he is the Messiah and they need to change their mold around what he says. Their view of Messiah is not what they think or their opinions, but what he says, what his truth reveals. It reminds me of an incident that happened not tremendously far from here, from Capernaum, up in, up in uh, Caesarea Philippi, in Matthew 16, where Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? Do you remember what Peter said? Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. To whom shall we go? Who else is there? Who? Donald Trump? Listen, I like Trump, don't get me wrong, but I'm not following him into eternity. I'm not following him ethically. Although he was a great president for us, I'm not following him. Not like I follow Jesus. To whom shall we go? Joe Biden? The Pope? To whom shall we go? Now, obviously, none of those figures were around in Peter's day, but Peter recognizes there is no one else. You have the words of eternal life. Jesus, uh, Peter recognizes that Jesus' words are spirit and life. Jesus is speaking words from the Father in heaven. He's speaking words of everlasting life. And notice what he says next in verse 69. We have believed. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Not only have we believed in the past, but we believe in the present. And it's not, it's not, there's no, there's no question about it. We know this as fact. There's no doubting it. They're absolutely convinced of it. They're willing to devote their lives on it. They're willing to stake their eternity on it. We have come to know as fact that you are the Holy One of God. You know, the feeding of the 5,000 was evidence. The turning of the water into wine, into new uh, uh, unfermented wine was evidence. The walking on water was evidence. We have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And when he walked on water and they saw him walk on water, they worshipped him. They have come to know that he is the Holy One of God. It is an awesome testimony that stands out in diametric opposition to the faith of the Capernaum Jews. That is, it's completely different. You have all these people who walk away, and you have the very few who stake their eternity on Jesus Christ. Sometimes I get the question, how can all these people be lost? Right? So you're telling me all these dot, dot, dots are lost? Whatever, this, this sect or that sect or that denomination or whatever, right? Or that religion. Uh, of course, Jesus says that uh, wide is the gate that leads to destruction and narrow is the way that leads to life. And here we see that displayed. All these people reject Jesus and just these 12, and really only 11 of them, are convinced that Jesus is the Messiah, when so many are convinced that he's a false prophet and walk away from him. 
And that even within this group of faithful disciples, there is a man who will not only walk away, but betray Jesus. Jesus answered them, did I not myself, did I myself not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? These are his hand-picked disciples. He chose these twelve out of the many, and one of them is a devil. Jesus answered them, did I, not, did I myself not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil, could be translated the devil. That is, the devil's behind the work of Judas. Now he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, Judas Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Uh, again, Jesus knew that Judas was planning on betraying him into the hands of the Jews. It's the worst betrayal that would ever take place. And now Judas is burning in hell for all eternity. His conviction got to him. He hung himself. His body bloated up with gases until it burst open and his innards fell headlong off the cliff. And now he's spending eternity in hell. And there's a picture of the two groups we see in today's passage. We see those who reject him and walk away from him. We see those inside the group of the so-called faithful who are, are not really legitimate, like Judas. And we see the faithful 11 who will follow him, almost all of them, to martyrdom. They'll die. To be a disciple, to be an apostle, almost always meant death. And I would ask the question, which group do you think you're part of? Which, which, which of those three groups do you most resonate with? Where do you think you lie? Are you part of the group that walks away when things are hard or when you hear the, the doctrine that you don't like or when you read stuff in the Bible that doesn't quite fit with your own personal moral, moral ethic? Are you the group that kind of looks like you're part of the faithful, but deep down inside, you're not? Or are you the faithful? In today's passage, people don't like what Jesus said, and so they walk away from him. And we see that so many people will ultimately turn away from him. It's something we can't deny. Anyone here ever meet a person who looked faithful and then ultimately just fell away and walked away, never to return? If you haven't seen a person like that yet, you haven't been saved long enough, because <laughs> you will. You'll see it. You will eventually see someone who looked faithful and committed and eventually stops being faithful and committed. You'll see a person who maybe was part of all the programs and eventually just stops worshiping altogether. So many people turn away from him. Even one of his closest followers will stab him in the back. And so we see that many will reject and oppose Jesus. And that same thing happens again today. People out there who have their own conceptions of what Jesus should be like, following Jesus as long as he fits their mold, following Jesus as long as they can live however they want to live, but the second they have to accept something, some doctrine they don't like, or the second they have to change or repent of something in their life, they walk. Don't be that guy. Don't be that group. Don't be those people that follow Jesus as long as he agrees with you. Don't be the guy that follows Jesus as long as you can continue living however you want. That's not genuine faith. That is a fraud. That's fraudulent faith. You need to commit to Jesus no matter what. Who else is there? To whom shall we go? He's the one that has the words of life. There is none, none other. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Only Jesus. You need to accept even the hard things that God calls us to do. You need to place your faith in Jesus as the Messiah and take up your cross in real life discipleship and follow him no matter the cost. 
I find that so many Christians have this look of, so many church people have this look of faithfulness, but man, I'll tell you what, all these other, all these other things, all these other activities or responsibilities ultimately take the place of God. Will you commit to genuine, devoted discipleship today? Will you commit to being a devoted follower of Jesus? Uh, if you would just bow your heads and close your eyes for just a brief moment of invitation. You're here in this room and you say, you know, I, I know, I know I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven when I die, but I, uh, there are some things in my life that have shown me I, I, I need to recommit to him. Is there anyone in this room, no one looking around, just you, me, and God, I want to recommit my life to following Jesus. I want to recommit to being a genuine disciple of him. Anyone at all, just raise your hand up. And I see that hand. Amen. I see that hand. I want to recommit to following Jesus. Today, maybe I've let some things slip. Maybe, maybe some of the things of the world have gotten in the way. I want to recommit my life to him today. Anyone else? You're here, and uh, you're not sure you're saved. You're not sure that if you die today, you're not sure that you go to heaven. Uh, I'd just like to ask you to raise your hand up just so I could see and, uh, and, and know and, and pray for you privately. I'm not sure I'm saved, but I'd like to be saved. Is there anyone in this room? I saw that hand. Is there anyone in this room? I'm not sure I'm saved, but I'd like to be saved. If you just raise your hand up for me. Heavenly Father, I praise you and thank you for your grace and your mercy. I pray for these who may be unsure of their own salvation, that you would help them to come to know your truth. I pray for any who are lost and maybe didn't want to raise their hands, that you would continue to convict such that they would understand their need for your, your gospel. And I pray for these who want to recommit to you. I pray that you would empower them by means of your, your Holy Spirit, such that they would recommit their lives to you or some aspect of their life to you and follow you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your hymnals and turn to 324. We will close our service. <clears throat> 324, stand and sing.